Welcome back to the channel and to our wacky 719cc 20 horsepower turbo diesel Honda. Today we're on the quest to see if we can generate more low end boost from the turbo we recently installed on the little Kubota diesel engine. So right away I want to let the new viewers know that this is not a conventional turbo. Instead it's a VNG or VGT type turbo and what that means is the turbo doesn't have a wastegate. Instead it has adjustable nozzles on the hot side of the turbine housing. And these nozzles can be manipulated to allow the turbo to spool up faster and to generate more boost on the low end. At least that's the theory. But the downside is the variable nozzles will also increase the back pressure between the engine and the turbocharger. Today we want to find out how much back pressure this turbo is creating and what would happen if we modify the factory calibration for the VNT linkage. Will this create so much back pressure that it will choke the exhaust stream from the engine and possibly cause us to lose power? Or will it allow the turbo to spool up even faster and create the low end boost that we're looking for? So we have quite a few experiments coming up. So if I apply vacuum to the actuator, you can see the VNT linkage move up to the point where it contacts the limit screw. The question is, what happens if we adjust the limit screw to allow more travel? Well, I guess we could adjust it willy nilly, but if we did that, we wouldn't have a clue as to how that changes the back pressure. So for today's experiments, we're going to install another gauge in the car, and this new gauge is going to measure the pressure of the exhaust before the turbocharger, and that way we can monitor the back pressure. Once we get our baseline data, then we can disregard any common sense and adjust the factory limit screw, you know, in the name of science and all that stuff. Now installing a back pressure gauge can get kind of tricky and that's because the exhaust system gets hot for some reason. So the plan is to tap into this pipe and run a 3 foot length of copper tubing and that's to dissipate the heat. Then we can connect the copper tubing to some high pressure nylon tubing and at that point we can connect the back pressure gauge. We are definitely doing this on the cheap and that's because this setup is more or less temporary. Alright let's get started. Today's turbo adjustment experiment was actually requested by several viewers and when I mentioned it in the previous turbo video, a lot more viewers suggested that I also monitor the back pressure, which totally makes sense. You know, the limit screw is obviously there for a purpose and since I'm not familiar with this type of turbo, my theory is, well, since the Kubota engine is smaller than the Lupo engine that the turbo was designed for, there may be room for adjustment. That theory is kind of based on ignorance and this experiment will solve a lot of unanswered questions, at least for me. Alright, we finally got the extension pipe removed. Let's go ahead and drill and tap it for the exhaust back pressure gauge. Fast forward a few minutes and I've tapped the hole to accept a 1 8 inch NPT nipple. I have no idea what the metric crowd would do in a situation like this. Anyway, I have a bunch more NPT stuff to convert the 1 8 inch to 1 quarter inch and then we can use a compression fitting to connect the quarter inch copper pipe. Through the magic of video editing the car is back together. The stack of fittings have been tightened and it's not pretty but it'll definitely work. Anyway, now we can attach the 3 foot section of copper pipe. The copper's high thermal conductivity will allow it to transfer all the heat to the air and the end of this pipe should stay relatively cool. Well, cool enough for what we needed to do. On this end of the pipe, I have a quick release fitting and that will allow us to connect a high pressure flexible nylon tube and that tube will connect to the pressure gauge. Ok let's start this piece and see what kind of back pressure we're dealing with. At this point there's no vacuum on the VNT actuator and there really shouldn't be any back pressure in the exhaust system. So at idle there's zero back pressure in the exhaust system. Let's see what happens when I goose the engine. Well that's excellent. There's actually zero back pressure in the entire exhaust system. And that makes sense because the exhaust system's way oversized for this engine and this car doesn't have a muffler. Let's apply full vacuum to the actuator and that'll move the nozzles into a position where the turbo is now trying to make boost. But since there's no load on the engine it won't actually make boost. However we should see some back pressure. And yeah there's some back pressure. Not much right now but as you can see when the turbo is in boost mode it does put a restriction on the exhaust. I think we need to do a road test and see how much back pressure we get when the turbo is making 5 psi boost. 
Okay, this is obviously the boost gauge and this is our back pressure gauge. Now this gauge is mounted upside down, so I reckon the folks in Australia will be able to read it just fine, but for everybody else, just be aware of its position. All right, now I'm going to accelerate the car normally and we wanna capture the back pressure when the boost hits five PSI. Perfect. Let me pause this. So it looks like we get about 9 PSI of back pressure when the turbo's developing 5 PSI of boost. Of course, that's with the VNT mechanism maxed out and it's hard up against the factory calibrated stop position. So this is a number that we can use for comparison after we alter the position of the stop screw. Now if we get more back pressure after we fiddle with the stop screw, then I reckon touching the factory calibration would have been a bad idea. But keep in mind, this is very educational and it shows how different the VNT VNT VGT turbos are from a conventional turbo. Anyway, I realize it may not be possible to increase the boost on the low end given that we're dealing with such a tiny engine and a mixed match turbo. The fact that we get any boost is actually a miracle. Let's head back to the shop so we can fiddle with the forbidden set screw and see if that's the answer we're looking for. The VNT turbo that we're using is supposed to be controlled by a computer. Now, obviously, right now, we're manually controlling it with a handheld vacuum pump. Now, the reason we haven't bothered dealing with the complexity of the computer controls is, despite this being a very advanced turbo, it's behaving like a conventional turbo. And it seems to work fine without a VNT controller. In reality, the turbo is not performing the way it was designed to. The root cause for the turbo not performing as expected is the 20 horsepower our Kubota engine is likely too small for this turbocharger. I think that's pretty obvious. Off camera, we have adjusted the nozzles to be less aggressive to see if that would help. And in every instance when we back off from the maximum position, the boost falls flat on its face. So if we did have a VNT controller actively managing the boost, it likely wouldn't be doing anything because the turbo doesn't generate enough boost to trigger the VNT controller. Today, we're experimenting to see if adjusting the limit screw will bump up the boost on the low end. It's a long shot for sure, but if we can force the turbo to at least get the 5 PSI sooner, then at that point actively managing the boost with a VNT controller will make sense. So our focus right now is between 0 and 5 pounds of boost, and how fast can we get the turbo to make 5 PSI? Now the next question is, if it can be done, how is that going to affect the exhaust back pressure? So we do have a plan, and depending on the results of the next experiment, that'll tell us what direction we need to go in. Okay, we're back at the shop. Let's do a quick check under the hood to verify that the copper tubing is wicking away all the heat from the back pressure gauge. So this section that's right off the extension pipe is warm, and over here this section is cool. Nice. It looks like there just isn't going to be a heat problem the way we have this set up. And it looks like we don't have any leaks on the extension pipe. Very nice. Let's move on to the second experiment. Now before I adjusted the set screw, I took a measurement so I would know my starting point and it looks like the screw measures at 2.4 millimeter. Next I loosened the locking nut, which actually wasn't very tight. Anyway, then I went in with an Allen wrench and backed off on the screw quite a bit, perhaps more than I should have. Then of course I tightened the locking nut. Now with the VNT nozzles in their new maximum position, let's see how much back pressure we have. Well, that's either good or bad. I'm guessing it's gonna be bad, but I could be wrong. Let's hit the road and we can see how the back pressure reacts with a load on the engine. Okay, I'm gonna accelerate normally and keep an eye on both gauges. Now, clearly we made things worse. The back pressure is pretty much off the scale and the boost is not happening at all. So, adjusting the factory calibration appears to be a bad idea, but there's always a chance I went too far. Perhaps we would have had better results if I tweaked the adjustment ever so slightly. 
Okay, back at the shop and I put the adjustment back in its original position and then backed it off one half turn. Let's see how that affects the back pressure with no load on the engine. All right, well, we have slightly more back pressure. Now, this is a snapshot of the back pressure with the factory setting, and as you can see, it went up just a tick. Now, will this translate to more boost? Well, there's only one way to find out. Okay, so we're just outside of town, and I have the VNT nozzles maxed out. Let's see what happens. You know, at first glance, the boost appears exactly the same despite having slightly more back pressure. Now that's something that we can all see, but from the driver's perspective, this car actually feels faster. And what I mean by that is the car keeps going faster, and it's hard to keep a constant load on the engine. Very interesting. So if we look at this snapshot from before, we can see a slight difference in back pressure, but we have the same amount of boost. You know, it's hard to say what's going on. The numbers say we're going in the wrong direction, but the car seems faster. Now, some of you folks may have noticed that we didn't touch the fuel rack settings at all, and that's on purpose. You see, we're only adjusting one thing at a time. Now, even though we didn't fiddle with the fuel rack settings, the engine does get extra fuel on acceleration, and that's because the governor slams the fuel rack to the max until the engine catches up to the throttle position. This is kind of a tractor thing. Normal diesel cars and trucks don't do this, but our engine does because it's an industrial engine, and it was never intended to be used in a car. Anyway, I'm kind of in a pickle because my gut feeling is adjusting the factory setting is not the direction we need to be going. But on the other hand, the car seems faster. However, I don't have any proof that's true. I reckon the right thing to do is to do a series of performance tests including the dreaded fuel economy run. Ugh, I hate doing those. Eh, it's the only way to know for sure. So here in the States, it's Independence Day weekend, and that means barbecue and blowing stuff up. I'm a big fan of both of those, so the performance testing is going to have to wait. But we did learn a few things. The homemade exhaust back pressure gauge works fine, but the gauge we're using only goes up to 15 PSI, and we probably need something that goes up to 30 or 40 PSI in order to capture the back pressure at full boost. You know, it's amazing how much back pressure is required to drive a turbo. And if you think about it, the energy it takes to spin a turbo isn't free. Nope, generally speaking, back pressure is never a good thing. But when it comes to a turbo, there's a trade-off, and the net result can be more power, despite putting a huge restriction on the exhaust. The AMR500 supercharger that we were running previously also put a load on the engine, but so far, it seems to have been the better choice as far as performance and fuel economy. But I have haven't given up on the turbo yet. Now every week I get dozens of comments saying I should try both the stupid charger and the turbo together. Yeah, I get it. But right now we're focused on trying to get the best overall performance from the turbo on this little Kubota diesel engine. I think on this stock diesel engine, the AMR500 would actually make the turbo redundant and perhaps if we ran both, we would actually lose performance. You know, there isn't a lot of engine under the hood of this car and there ain't a lot of space either. For now, let's just see what the turbo has to offer. 
Well, I'm off for a few days, but I'll be back next week with something different. Did any of you folks catch a sneak peek of the new project car? It wasn't much of a peek, but I reckon some of you can figure out what it was. We'll see you next time. Until then.